just because you've conducted a research project doesn't mean it's any good, right? The whole reason we have a discipline of methodology is because we recognize that sometimes you do research and it fails, right? And regardless of what paradigm you're coming from, everybody knows it's possible to do bad research, right? Um, we have a discipline of research methods because we want to work on making sure we get better results more of the time. So there are a bunch of tools that researchers use to try to improve their methodology um, and improve their research, right? And so what we're gonna talk about in this section, and it's gonna be shared between me and David, is we are gonna talk about some different ways that you can check your work and some principles that we put into the research process to try to help that process along. So the first principle, which is just one of those things we all have to acknowledge, is that we're never 100% sure that we know what we think we know. This is not a positivist versus interpretivist thing. Nope, nobody is 100% sure ever, right? Um, and we know that in order to be honest, we have to present our uncertainty in a way that like helps the reader understand what is happening, right? Um, so I have here two quotes from, for the first is from Schwartz Say and Yanow, which uh, is on interpretive research design. And the second is from King, Cohen and Verba, which is a positivist uh, approach. The book's called Designing Social Inquiry. And what you can look at, if you pause the video for a moment and read these two quotes, in both cases, they're saying, you need to give people enough information to judge your trustworthiness, right? You need to give them that information. You, um, whether it's a matter of making estimates of your uncertainty, right? Um, or whether it's in being reflexive about your knowledge generation practices, um, all of this leads to greater confidence in your work. If you read somebody who acts like it's utterly impossible that they could have made a mistake, we should be less certain of that person's research, right? Being honest and open about uncertainty is how we do it. But we also do it through using tricks and tools that really support the process of developing uh, an adequate sense of certainty, right? It doesn't just mean we're like, I don't know, man, it's just my thoughts. No, that's, that's a cop out, right? Instead, we use tools to try to uh, be clear about this. And you're gonna see that these tools come from different paradigms right um so pay attention to if you see that little tree somewhere on the slide then you're looking at something that's positivist in its orientation if you see the little purple palm tree then you know this is an interpretivist principle for dealing with uncertainty um but it's really important they're all really important and they kind of we could have a big conversation about how they're related but nobody wants to hear me talk for quite that long so the first principle i'm going to talk about is validity Right? And validity is this question of, are we actually talking about what we think we're talking about? Right? We have to make sure that the data we collected connects to the concepts and ideas we're studying. There's a lot of information we want that actually isn't out there for the taking. Right? And remember that data is something that we make in the research process, not something that we like pick like apples off the tree. Right? Um, and so there are a couple different types of validity right? So face validity is, does this concept make any sense whatsoever, right? Um, so let's say I want to study how democratic a country is based on how many different brands of cars are available uh, to consumers in that country. Well, that's utter freaking nonsense, right? Like, I could maybe understand a principle where because democracy and capitalism have gone together in the world system, that countries that are, that are successful consumer capitalist countries might be more likely to be democratic. So, like, maybe you could observe a correlation between democracy and the number of cars, but to kind of use number of car brands as a proxy is just ridiculous. Right? So that's something that doesn't have any face validity. And then the concept of content validity is does it match the concept you are trying to understand? Again, here my car brand one falls down on the job. 
Um, but what if you tried to use satisfaction with government as a way, how satisfied people are with government as an opinion on how satisfied they are with democracy? Well, they might like democracy in the abstract, but not like their particular government. They might not think their government is democratic. They might think their demo government is democratic and think that it's a bad thing, right? The content of these two concepts don't really match each other. And then this last type of validity is construct validity. And this one's a little more complicated. But let's, because it means that should it act like the thing we would expect the thing we're trying to understand to act. So let's say you're looking at level of education and you're choosing to measure level of education through years of schooling. But you find that years of schooling decrease with age, right? Well, that makes it a little hard to use that across the entire lifespan, right? Um, because it doesn't quite act, you know, normally we would expect that as, as age increases, years of schooling increase because you have more time to go to school, right? A six-year-old can't have that many years of schooling. An 18-year-old can't have that many years of schooling, right? There's more schooling to come, potentially. Um, so you could imagine trying to use years of schooling as a proxy for level of education, but maybe people in an earlier period of time didn't attend school as long. Right? Maybe school wasn't offered for free at when they were young, right? And of course, there are trade offs to pursuing education later in life. So, therefore, you kind of have to wonder about the construct involved in this, right? And, and does it actually really match? The important thing to know is that researchers care a lot about whether their data is valid because it determines basically whether or not the data actually matches the thing they really want to talk about. If you've collected data that doesn't have validity to it, then you really haven't gathered much at all. And now I'm going to hand it over to David to talk about reliability and some other concepts and give us great examples from the world of child welfare research. Now, reliability is a little bit different. Reliability is all about getting the same results every time that you try. Um, it can be would two people give the same results? So would two people, let's say two therapists of the same kid, uh, say that the kid is super happy or super functioning well in school? Um, is it rec replicable? And, and also there's like a question of uh, data entry as well. That was a big thing that I did. So we would get all these forms coming in saying how the kids are doing, what their diagnoses are. Well, what if my, what if my colleague makes a mistake? How do we know that just because my system says there is zero, which is good, uh, that that's what the form even said, much less what the uh, therapist meant to write. So reliability is just, just a lot to do with getting the same data over and over. We would enter a lot of the data that we entered twice, just to make sure that everything was set up properly. But, uh, Reliability also can be about, you know, you do an interview and then say, and give some analysis and kind of say, does this even resonate for you? Does this sound like what you said? Would the people involved recognize the data? It's that last question. Um, or, yeah, like, um, like for instance, the, uh, the uh, psychological evaluation that we did on kids and child welfare, we did research that showed uh, intercoder reliability. Let's say two therapists looked at the same kid same case and knew the kid and then they filled out the same form about how the kid was doing we had studies that showed that not uh, over 95 percent of the uh, the answers would be they would be very very close so we knew that when people knew live kids um, and they filled out our form that it was very reliable and that even if you wrote down case notes and then filled out the form on case notes and compared that with somebody that was like the kid's therapist knew the kid super well they would get, they would be within 80% accurate. So, so we knew that even by reading case notes, you would get pretty accurate information. Uh, you, that means out of 105 questions, you'd miss, you know, you'd be off by a lot on, on only a few. So, uh, uh, well, 95 questions on the kid or, or something like that. So you wouldn't be too, too off and you'd never be very, very, like you have a huge difference of opinion. So, 
Um, so we, we had a whole training system for the therapist to make sure that they passed the test by 80%. So we knew that, you know, once they were trained, that they would be very reliable coders. We had lots of research behind our, our, um, the form that we used. It's called psychometrics, kind of psychometric research, just making sure that everything on the form was backed up by data and that the coder reliability was super. So, so we knew that the studies, data, and concepts that this was backed up by, you know, we know that certain kinds of trauma cause certain kinds of effects later, and then it's important to have on the list, things like that. Reflexivity. So how does the researcher's position influence the data? So for instance, in the study that we did, we were coming from a university and we were working with state agencies and, uh, and nonprofits who did uh, child welfare work. So uh, we had to ask ourselves, how much does the fact that we at the university the fact that we work with line workers, therapists, and then their supervisors and the program directors, if we tell people, oh, this therapist, they're not doing so good, how much are they likely to you know, fudge their results or saying, oh yeah, that kid's getting better. Um, so these are things we had to think about, even though it's pretty hard to control for it. But uh, it was also possible to, sometimes caseworkers and therapists would fill out an evaluation on the same kid within a short amount of time. And we actually measured that it was pretty rare that people disagreed. Again, a, a very, very reliable kind of uh, uh, form that we were using. So, but it's something to think about, you know, um, how does the fact that we're doing research influence the kind of data that we get? Um, and yeah, how and where am I placed to facilitate access to data? You know, I, I tried to, I worked with the therapist a lot. I tried to just be super trustworthy and, uh, and uh, really generous so to build their trust and things like that so that hopefully that I would get the most accurate information that I could. Um, but yeah, some of these things, they're hard to control for. And then checking sense making. How, how sure am I that there isn't a better explanation? Well, this is really important when you do um, abductive reasoning, of course. One of my master's thesis, I worked on Stephen Harper's justice policies. He was prime minister from 2000 and was it four? Oh, dang. 2006 to 2015, and um, he had this big get tough on crime thing the entire time he was prime minister, but crime had been falling for 15 years before he became prime minister, so it's pretty weird. It didn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, voters were kind of saying, yawn, we don't really care about your tough on crime stuff, so it just kind of ended up being, my thesis was this puzzle of why on earth is Steve Harper doing this get tough on crime thing, considering that even a lot of conservatives don't really care, uh, considering that you know, crime has been falling, considering that this isn't a good policy, it just seemed weird. And that's that kind of sense-making question. You know, I could say my thesis was about conservatism. I could say, ah, it's because he's conservative and he has, uh, you know, he wants to reinforce certain moral values and that kind of thing around uh, sexuality and, and uh, you know, 60s new left values um, that he's opposing. I could say that as much as I want, but there were a bunch of sense-making questions. Like, wouldn't it make more sense that he's just trying to get votes or differentiate himself from the Liberal Party? Or maybe, maybe he really thinks that this getting tough on crime policies are helping somebody. So I have to do a lot of checking the sense-making. I have to say, does this make sense? Does this explanation make sense? Okay, Harper knows that his policies don't do anything. In fact, his policies are mostly symbolic. Okay, that doesn't make sense that he thinks he's really impacting crime. Okay, what about vote getting? Well, that doesn't really make sense. His base doesn't care. The wedge doesn't care. General voters don't care. Like, it just doesn't make sense that this is about elections. All right, does this make sense if we look at ideology? And there I was able to say, aha, this is starting to make sense because look at this factor and his speech from 2003 and uh, the, the overall thrust of his policies. So yeah, sense checking the sense making and making sure there isn't a better explanation. It's really important. And especially when you do kind of puzzle based research. Um, so yeah, how do you know that there isn't a better explanation? Um, and I never, <laughs> people always ask me, do you wanna show your master's thesis to Harper? I said, I don't care. Would you interview Harper? I was like, not really. I don't, I don't think I would get meaningful information, but you know, it's a good question. Do you, the people in the data recognize the narrative? If I showed this to him and said, here's what I think is going on, um, would he agree? And I, I think in his heart of hearts, 
he would. But that doesn't mean that if I interview him or say, hi, Stephen, would you, um, this is what I think. Don't you think that's true? That he would want to talk to me. Um, that's different. But anyway, um, so, and I did a lot of triangulation. I did a lot of, well, here are biographical facts showing that Stephen Harper is very uh, ideological. So he probably doesn't just do things to get votes unless he believes in them somewhat. Um, so yeah, so uh, that is sense making. That's an important part of this whole validity, reliability, and uh, you know the sense making. These are all important checks that we do when we build our study.